And it's probably connected in some ways to some of the stereotypes and defi the defamations connected to the, the three Ds. But you never really be able to show that. So what I try to do is to ask, well, why is it? Why is it that the three Ds and the other aspects of these definitions could be considered anti-Semitic in the first place? You know, it's interesting. A lot of people who support these definitions think it's almost self-evident that if you demonize Israel, it's anti-Semitic. And then there are other people who think it's utterly preposterous and that the only reason to even suggest this is to suppress criticism of Israel. And yet there's very little analysis of, well, why would it be that certain kinds of hostility towards the nation of Israel would be anti-Semitic and others not? Well, I'm going to suggest that there are four conditions under which hostility to Israel should be considered anti-Semitic. And I think that this can be helpful in trying to figure out what is and what isn't anti-Semitic in cases where the specific examples from EUMC, State Department, and Sharansky don't seem to answer the question. The first three, I think, are somewhat intuitive, and the fourth one will take some explanation. I, I refer to them as intentionality, tacitness, nemesis, and Jewish traits. I'll tell you what I mean by that. First one is intentionality. I think that that's what's most intuitively obvious to people. Sometimes people use a term like anti, like, like Zionism, and they mean Jews. They'll attack Zionists, and it's clear that that's what they mean is they're attacking Jews. Martin Luther King Jr. understood that at the end, so we got what to say about it. And I think that there's fairly widespread understanding that if you're looking at Soviet propaganda from the Cold War period, and the word Zionist is used in a derogatory context, then it's a reference to Jews. I don't think there's much controversy to that. There's an understanding that hostility towards Zionism in Soviet propaganda is conscious, intentional, deliberate, anti-Jewish. And there's also, I think, fairly widespread uh, consensus that when white supremacists today, uh, extreme right-wing white supremacists uh, speak of Zionism, it's a fairly transparent uh, and thinly coded reference to Jews. There's a little more controversy, of course, when it comes from the left, which is where you would see on college campuses. But the general notion is that there are some times when people speak of Israel or of Zionism and it's a code for Jews. So that's conscious. It's conscious, intentional, and in some sense, it can also be unconscious or tacit. Uh, we know that with respect to racism, since the Second World War, people are less likely to admit to being racist even in the context of being anti-black because it is socially unacceptable in most circles uh, in the West. So oftentimes, people won't admit even to themselves the extent of their own prejudice against black people or against other minorities. And there's a psychological literature showing that you can sometimes find prejudice in people who deny the prejudice, and there are different tests for showing it. This is true about anti-Jewish attitudes, same as anything else, that sometimes people speak ill of Israel, and it's code for, uh, for feeling ill towards Jews. There was a study about a connection between uh, anti-Israel attitudes and anti-Jewish attitudes by someone named Kaplan at Yale a few years ago, right? Small and Kaplan. Small and Kaplan. Thank you. Small and Kaplan. I think that the uh, co-author is nearby. So that's tacitness. Third one I would call mimetic. That is the notion that uh, in addition to anti-Israel hostility being sometimes conscious, sometimes unconscious, there are times when there is a uh, climate of opinion towards uh, Israel that has anti-Jewish elements to it. So. Let's suppose you will uh, see, it might be a cartoon, it might be a speech, there will be a reference to Israel that uses the blood libel. You know, the term the blood libel? Okay, so there will be, there will be some, some uh, recoding or refashioning of this notion that Jews kill Gentile babies for, uh, for ritual or ceremonial purposes. This, I would say, is anti-Semitic if it is a conscious if it is a conscious slur on the Jewish people, or if it's an unconscious slur on the Jewish people. But even if the person who's saying it or writing it is, is utterly unaware of the connection to the history of anti-Semitism, 
I would say it is nevertheless anti-Semitic because the very, the very symbols and words that are used carry within them a meaning and culture. So it shouldn't matter whether the individual mind has within it this intent if a person uses words and terms and languages and images that carry, carry on history of anti-Semitism, that's anti-Semitic too. So these are the first three, which I would say is conscious intentional anti-Semitism, tacit anti-Semitism, uh, and uh, this mimetic, this notion that uh, sometimes uh, cultural codes are carried within uh, speech and expression, whether it's conscious or unconscious or not. Now there's a fourth one as well that seems to me to be important, especially especially legally, and this is what I would call Jewish traits, which is to say the following. There are some times when a harm is directed to a characteristic or trait which is essential, which is essential to a group, it's central to the group. Uh, maybe you say, I'm not misogynistic, I'm not anti-woman, but uh, I don't want pregnant people on my staff. No, I'm, I'm, I'm gender neutral about it. Right? So, any pregnant men will not be able to work here either. So, what do we say about someone who discriminates against pregnancy? Well, maybe, maybe this person is, is, really doesn't like women and knows he doesn't like women, so it's conscious. Maybe it's unconscious. It does, doesn't, doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Pregnancy discrimination is considered a form of sex discrimination because it really is directed something, something that's central to female group. It doesn't matter whether a woman can become no longer pregnant or not. Um, it's something about being a woman and it's separate from others. Right? Attachment to Israel is not quite the same as pregnancy. But it is something that is centrally connected to Jews in a way that is not connected to other sorts of groups as well. Now, I'll tell you that American, well, this came up. I'll give you an example. It just came up, unfortunately, in the wrong way. In a court case in England that was somewhat celebrated recently, although it was only at the level of the Colonial Tribunal. Anyone familiar with the Ronnie Fraser case? Ronnie Fraser is a mathematician and a lecturer in England, a very fine gentleman, who was also a pro Israel activist. Uh, and he believed that his union, uh, called the UCU, uh, was anti Semitic. And much of his evidence had to do with their uh, anti-Israel uh, activities, uh, their uh, various uh, motions and resolutions to condemn Israel or to seek a boycott of Israel, uh, their criticism of the EUMC working definition, and so on and so forth. Uh, and he went to court to the Employment Tribunal in England, uh, saying that this was uh, discriminating, discrimination against him not as a Zionist, but as a Jew. And that to have a constant barrage of anti-Zionist propaganda within the Union was an affront to him as a Jew, either racially or religiously, or under what other, whatever rubric you, you will describe it under, under English law. The tribunal said no. The tribunal said no, there is not an integral relationship between attachment to Israel and being Jewish. Well, there are different ways in which you might feel about Fraser's claim, but the tribunal's conclusion was wrong in a way that I think makes you think twice about this. Because there is, within the Jewish community, a wide range of views about Israel, to be sure, and a lot of debate. And yet, over 3,000 years, there has been an attachment of the Jewish people to the state of Israel, which seems to be about as close as any group can claim any kind of a trade over that period of time. And over this period, while there hasn't been unanimity, there have certainly been a large number of members of the group who have considered this attachment to Israel to be fairly strong as part of their group identity. It has been pervasive of the literature of the, of the people. And you can see it in various practices including prayers said by German Jews three times every day while facing Jerusalem, not to mention the uh, statement within the Passover Seder uh, and other, uh, other uh, expressions within the, within the liturgy and uh, in the 
literature. So this is fairly, uh, fairly pervasive. Uh, is it is it strong enough? No. Legally, there is a notion uh, that irrational trait discrimination is unlawful only if it is immutable. And the Supreme Court, in one decision, said that immutability means the trait has to come. And under that notion, if you say, um, uh, I was not permitted to speak Spanish in the workplace, and that's a trait of being a, a member of my uh, ethnicity, the courts have said no, it's not immutable. Uh, or if you have been uh, told that you can't wear braided hair, and you say, well, that's part of my ethnic uh, group, and the courts have said no. But the recent trend has been to say that this notion of immutability as being something from birth uh, is an overly essentialistic or biologic notion of what group identity is. That it doesn't really make sense about any sorts of group, and then, that in fact very little about group identity is true from birth, and that this is a misunderstanding of what group identity is. So the trend has been either to criticize or to eliminate the notion of or alternatively, to redefine immutability to be more normative rather than essential, which is to say that if we're going to use the notion of immutability, we need a characteristic that someone either cannot or should not be required to change. And within that definition, I think that the attachment to Israel is fairly clearly a strong example of immutability. Former Judge Michael McConnell, as an example of something considered an immutable trait, said that a Jewish person shouldn't be asked to celebrate the Sabbath on a day other than Saturday. Right? Because this is something that's been, the Jewish people have been attached to for thousands of years. And I would argue that the connection to Israel uh, is uh, about as strong or comparable in strength uh, to the attachment to, the, uh, to, uh, uh, to Shabbat. So for all of these reasons, I would argue that uh, if there is an attack on a central Jewish trait, it should, even under uh, recent American law, uh, be considered to be a form of anti-Semitism to the same extent as if it were uh, intentional, tacit, or mimetic, and that these four categories together provide a useful starting point for understanding when incidents uh, should be considered anti-Semitic uh, and when they are other forms of hostility towards Israel. Thank you for uh,